rough weather calls for rapid action from the Coast Guard. Tight strap him! The boat crew carves a path through furious surf to help one of their own. The winds were blowing, you know, 25 to 35 knots, and the seas were, you know, 14 to 16 feet in the main channel. Air Station Astoria scales mountains in search of a gravely injured ice climber. We would always want an exit plan because, worst case scenario, we don't want to end up crashing into a mountain. And when a young man teeters at the edge of a cliff, a Coast Guard rescuer takes on the ultimate risk. It's a little unnerving being a flight mechanic, seeing your rescue swimmer walking up a cliff, wondering, you know, okay, well, what happens if he falls or he gets hurt? High peaks and tumultuous waters make Cape Disappointment and the Pacific Northwest one of the most hazardous environments in North America. At the heart of it all is the Columbia River Bar. This deadly area has taken countless vessels and claimed hundreds of lives. In the air and on the sea, brave men and women of the U.S. Coast Guard risk their own safety so that others may live in a place known as the Graveyard of the Pacific. Hey, what channel are they on? We got a call from the Coast Guard cutter Cuddy Hunk. Said they were coming across the bar and they were having some electrical issues. Are we going to take them all the way to the story, Chief? No. Just across the bar. We escort boats across the Columbia River Bar when the conditions are so severe that they might become in danger. For a uh, major Coast Guard cutter like the Cuddy Hunk to call for assistance from a small boat station is very rare. Where is he? They've lost their electrical power. At any second, they could lose everything. If they were to be just at the mercy of the sea, they could capsize and roll over. Tight strap him. Since the beginning of uh, people crossing the Columbia River Bar, it has been inherently dangerous and unpredictable. Today, I thought I knew what I was going to get myself into, and as soon as we got outside in the channel, I realized conditions are worse than I, we had planned for. Woo! It's, it's windy out. And the winds were blowing, you know, 25 to 35 knots, and the seas were, you know, 14 to 16 feet in the main channel. And we're making about 20 knots. It feels about 50 miles per hour for the wind. And then it's raining, so the rain feels like you're getting small pebbles thrown at your face. It's very unpleasant. Can tell the crew is experiencing the same discomfort as I am. They're all holding on tight, embracing their knees for the impact, which is about every two seconds. It's kind of like dropping down that first drop of a roller coaster. Your stomach drops, you get lifted out of your seat, but it's not as smooth. You're coming down, you're hitting hard. It hurts. There's a Cuddy Hunk. Cuddy Hunk 248, we're up here off your bow off of uh, number six here. Our plan is to just come around, swing off your stern, and, and escort you in. If uh, you have any difficulties, we'll come alongside over. My biggest fear for the Cuddy Hunk is that it's going to lose power. I know that the captain of the ship can handle these conditions as long as his ship remains running. We took a lot of weather coming out. Uh, once we get turned around behind them, the seas are on our stern. But now it's a whole different set of problems. Put on my stern, Clark. All right. On the starboard. Following seas are always more difficult to negotiate as a boat operator. One wave will look like it's going to stand up and then will let off, and you'll let your guard down for a second and then look back behind you, and it's doubled up, and now it's twice as big and coming for you, and it's right on your stern. Build on your stern. My head's on a swivel. The crew's looking behind, calling out the, the waves that are breaking, and you know, five, 10 waves back, and then what's coming for us? my break.
As the bigger swell started to come through, and we're looking at almost 16 foot waves at this point, the Cuddyhunk started to surf down the face of some of the waves. And it's not something you want to do. It could turn into a bad situation quick. I'm trying to break them down as much as I can. In order to help with the situation, we created a series of S turns and basically put our boat in the path of the breaking waves and the bigger swell to help break them down. Build the starboard. Close side of port. Pretty clear on this side. We got the Cuddy Hunk to a safe area. And it was just a big sigh of relief among the crew. We knew that the, the boat was good, it was safe. Good morning, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the assistance. We're inside, and uh, if we have any trouble, we should be able to stand by our Cuddy Hunk 248, it was a pleasure crossing the bar with you and have a safe trip the rest of the way home, over. Being able to escort the Cuddy Hunk in today is uh, it's an opportunity, and it just feels good knowing that we could provide help. So it's such a big, you know, self-reliant asset in case they needed it. Connie, welcome aboard. Scott McGrew. Nice to meet you. Hi. Nice to meet you. Meredith, Nice to meet you. Have a seat, please. So we just had uh, four brand new third class cadets report aboard for their first phase of summer cadet training. We exist here because of a mission. And our mission is heavy weather search and rescue operations in heavy surf. And Station Cape Disappointment is known through the lore and Coast Guard history. When you operate in the dangerous environments that we do, um, there is a history of tragedy here. We owe it to the people that served here before us to kind of serve with pride and continue to serve with distinction to uphold their legacy. It's their first real step away from the Coast Guard Academy. So we just kind of set the stage here for their summer training at uh, Cape Disappointment. My name's Jacqueline Kabiko. I go to the United States Coast Guard Academy, and I'm here on my third class summer assignment. Coming to the station was kind of like a once in a lifetime experience for all of us. What if you guys are out in the middle of anywhere? Should you be swimming at all? No. 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 Minimize movement. Save your body heat. So let's get together. We'll start the pyro portion of our exercise. What's step one? Point in a safe direction. Yep, point the flares in a safe direction. We are testing out a bunch of different kinds of flares. Basically, it's just us testing them, so if the time comes when we actually need to use them, we'll know how and know the correct procedures for doing so. You guys are looking good in the water. The cadets are doing awesome. They're working well together as a team. So everybody gather around. We got to practice the PIW recovery. We have a recovered man overboard. Get him on board. Pull up, pull up. Sometimes you just got to abandon the technique and just muscle that person on board. Good job. It's a great opportunity because when they find themselves in a leadership position and they have to make decisions for people that are at the pointy tip of the spear, they're out there doing this sort of thing, they'll have this to fall back on and remember what it was like. All right, so it's lunchtime. There is a individual that fell down a cliff about a thousand feet. Just be aware that we're gonna be flying between peaks, mountains, and ridges, so keep your eyes out for wiring. Hypothermia was definitely a concern. He'd been laying on ice for over an eight hour period. I just talked to the sheriff. They'll have a backup ground party moving toward the individual as well. It was around dinner time, and we got a call from the command center saying that we had a skier up in Snoqualmie Pass who fell down the mountain. And we got a report that he had several broken bones, a concussion, and he had early onset hypothermia. We're going here. OK. This is, I mean, it's a matter of eight miles. When we do any sort of operations in the mountains, it takes a little extra scrutiny. While we do train, 
we don't spend the majority of our time there. The mountain ridge that this gentleman fell off of was just over 6,000 feet. We try to scrutinize some maps to see if, what the terrain is like, because that does alter how much power we're going to need and what our flyout capabilities are should we have any emergency. So our plan is to fly up to the mountains towards the Snoqualmie Pass, and then um, pick our way up the ridge, do the hoist, land at the Snoqualmie ski area, where the sheriff is corralling everyone to have some EMS waiting once we take a look at the patient. If his particular situation isn't good, we may have to stabilize him and kind of work on the ground a little bit as well. So it's your plan to stay up there, go with the land. Landing would be the ideal. So if, if, we, if we have an obvious, like, oh no, we'll just land right there, then that's what we'll do. If we have to orbit, then we'll orbit. All right, so weather, we're gonna experience some low-lying fog that we're gonna be over during the transit. Ready goes. All right, we'll uh, climb in and ride the helicopter up. Screw for take off. Ready for takeoff. Hey guys, just be aware that we're gonna be flying between peaks, mountains, and ridges, so keep your eyes out for any types of wiring. Most cases, we normally encounter uh, search and rescue at about less than 1,000 feet because it's normally water. In this case, we're going up to 5,200 feet, which would be less air, less visibility, as well as high terrains. So when we're in the pass, let's always have a bailout, preferably downhill, and preferably not in the direction of the power line. So we'll just identify like all the valleys that we can take if we start losing power, drooping, or have an emergency. Roger. We would always want an exit plan because, worst case scenario, we don't want to end up crashing into a mountain. Yeah, so the risk of blowing these guys farther down the hill versus, you know, the risk of you walking on an icy surface. So that's going to be a judgment call on all of our parts once we go on scene to see the conditions. I agree with you. Try to keep as much away from them as we can. With a fall like this, your concern is, what was the fall like? thousand foot slide down the side of a hill is an enormous amount of injury and possible death. So we're concerned about how severely uh, the individual is actually injured and what we need to actually do once we arrive to package them to prepare them for a medevac. This may not be a quick thing. Yeah, sure. This, this may be a couple of hours dragging him to a better spot or stabilizing him where he is. Roger. There's multiple things that could happen. Ground party 3-5. Question though, the condition, the side of the mountain, snow, ice, what you may have at this time. We actually had pretty good comms with the ground crew. Talking with them, one of the big concerns was there was a lot of ice. Uh, they were all wearing crampons. I had mine with me, so I ended up actually putting those on. We're gonna start breaking the litter and setting it up. Sounds good. When we arrived on scene, we're in an area that is different for us. It's one that we do not normally operate in. And we're also trying to find these folks, and they're kind of set in just under a peak. Headlamp at, uh, at 4 o'clock. Inside. Once we had their position, uh, we're kind of looking at the area. We used the FLIR to kind of scan the area to see if there were any dangers from the face, from the tips, trees, things like that. Can you ask them that they have the ability to bring the patient down? Maybe we can find a spot that's a little bit closer to us, possibility of putting me down and I can meet them. As soon as we got up there, we realized that the individual was in the back of the bowl a little bit further than we thought. We talked to them, thought it would be a better idea if they helped slide the individual down about 100 feet. Swimmer's going down. on deck. Went down with the litter. There was already somewhat of a medical team that was on the ground. As I assessed the patient, uh, I noticed that they had already placed a splint on his leg. They had it wrapped up. He was also complaining of shoulder pain. Hypothermia was definitely a concern. He'd been laying on ice for over an eight hour period. Unfortunately, I had to move the arm to place him in our litter, and I knew that that was going to be a little bit painful. 
He did not speak a lot of English, so we tried to explain it with hand movements the best we could. Hey, Sean, I'll just give you a heads up. We're getting reports from Seattle Center and the ground party that they're pretty fogged in, and we're getting low on fuel. Swimmer's going down. There is a individual that fell down a cliff about a thousand feet. Um, he's been down there several hours. We came up the left-hand side of the valley, put Chief Sayers down. It was uh, about an 80-foot hoist, and then instantly he unhooked, went up the hill, and met up with the ground party. Hey, Sean, just give you a heads up. We're, we're getting low on fuel, so we're getting reports from the Seattle Center and the ground party that they're pretty fogged in. As I assessed the patient, I could hear over the radio while we were packaging the patient that they were low on fuel and that we had lost our two landing sites that we had set up as our primary and our secondary. Litter recovery and service recovery of the litter. Working under that type of a time constraint and then being on an area that's that slick, you have to pay attention to what you're doing to make sure that the patient is placed into the equipment correctly. And at the same time, make sure you don't lose any of your equipment or your footing sliding down the hill. Litter's coming up. You know, the guy's cold, he's hurt. So bringing him up, I try to make it as comfortable of a situation as I can for him. And litter's in the cabin. We got the individual in the litter into the plane. We came back over and uh, hoisted Chief Sayers back up. Blamer is, is at the cabin door. Hoist the plate. Sector of Puget Sound, request if any further information on places to land, over. I was handling all the radios, trying to find a place for us to land, because I found out that the, the area of the landing zone was, was fogged in. Coast Guard Rescue 6035, we're running low on fuel. Request wait on vectors for final. We had so much chaos going on that all four crew members were working to tend to the patient, organize the cabin. I'm flying away, Adriana's on the radio, talking to three different people, trying to figure out what has the best weather to take this patient to. Hey guys, just give you a heads up, we're headed toward Boeing. ETA, 15 minutes. Roger, man. Roger. We determined that Boeing Field was our best option because they have a lot of lights that we would be able to see once we get down to a certain altitude. Crew four, ready for approach. He's kind of in and out. You hand me a blanket real quick. It was a huge relief to be able to land safely and deliver the survivor to level one trauma care. So start helicopter 6013, clearly active, taxiing Alpha 2 to the ramp. This case was very dynamic and very difficult considering the weather, the moving parts that we had, and how everything was changing as the flight went on. Go offline. It's a great feeling to know that in his 11th hour and his time of need that he absolutely needed someone and we were able to be there to help him out. with Derek, who is the injured skier that uh, Adriana and I picked up uh, a couple months ago. And we are about to meet him and see how he's doing. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, yes. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're very welcome. Yeah, thanks a lot. You guys saved my brother's life. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much. Hey, Thank nice you. Nice to meet you. It's Thank amazing. You so much. How are you doing? Uh, two rib bone is broken. Oh. Color were broken, two screws on the ankle. What happened? Yeah, I was like, I'm going to look. You want to be Korean? Oh, tell me about it. Oh, I'm going to look. Oh, I'm going to look. Oh, my gosh. How do you know the Korean? My mother is a Korean. Oh, my goodness. There's a picture of my mother. There's a picture of my mother. There's a picture of my mother. He said he had the picture. My name is Derek Kim. I live in Takuma. I heard the thought of falling down. 
그래서 눈앞으로 지나가는 그 얼음판을 보면서 그러니까 다리만 안 다치게 어떻게 서보자, 스탑을 해보자 라는 생각을 하고 있었죠. 아무튼 막 바람이 막 내려치니까 추운 거 밖에 생각이 안 나. 눈을 뜨고 살짝 본 거하고. 뭐 말할 필요도 없이 너무너무 고맙고. 정말로 이렇게 다른 사람의 생명을 구하면서 그런 일을 한다는 것 자체가 너무 감사한 일이고 내 아이들이 만약에 커서 그런 일을 하겠다고 한다면 적극적으로 어, 밀어주고 싶고 그렇지. Any vessels in the area are requested to assist if possible and make all reports to this Coast Guard unit. Sector Columbia River out. It's about just after four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, we got a call about a PIW. Uh, we're going to take off and uh, get there on scene as quick as we can. See if we can't uh, locate the survivor and then recover. Okay, guys. All I got is person of water. I'll try to get a little more info. We're moving here. I think it's that little cove south end of Long Beach. Once we get in the air, it's going to be about a five-minute transit over there. It's real close. We don't really know any details right now, but depending on any age of person, this is a uh, rough water. There will also be a Coast Guard 47-footer out there as well. Left. Just keep an eye off that side as we get into the beach. Coast 248, unseen in Beards Hollow. Any surf in the water in Beards Hollow, i uh, really worried about them uh, maybe getting beat up against the rocks, getting carried out in the rip current. It was really important we got out there quick and see if we could find them. We don't have a description, right? No. Yeah, no description. We didn't have a physical description of the, of the person in the water, so we were just heading out there looking for anybody that may appear to be in distress. Next year from 2-Diner, we are on scene, along with the Coast Guard 47. We also have the fire department on the beach. Right now, my crew, we're all looking out, um, just flying low level in a hover. We got the aircraft automated as we can make it safely so we can focus our attention outside right now. One guy's up at North End said he saw something that looks like a body floating in the surf just south of the lighthouse. Hold on. Here, sir. These guys at the lighthouse taking pictures apparently saw something in the surf zone right here. So just look out the right side. If you see anything in the water there. Roger. Can I see those vinyls real quick? I've seen a flash in the same spot twice now up along that cliff. Did you see anything? I'm not seeing anything. I didn't see anything. Searching near surf can be difficult because the waves breaking on the rocks. You think you see splashing, you think that could be a person. Such plays tr tricks on your eyes. Sounds kind of hokey. Yeah, well, it's an anonymous caller. Why are you anonymous? So you went off right here. Have you? Did he have his board with him? Oh, really? All right. All right. You want to call the station, let him know that we ran it from Beers Hollow to the North Jetty. No results. We're heading back to the rhythm position. The case is starting to sound a little strange. Uh, we're getting these calls that the, uh, they can't get the uh, reporting source back on the phone. No one else can confirm that they saw anyone go in. No one's reported as missing. Sector Club River, Coast Guard 6029. We received word from Pacific County that the reporting source was anonymous and could not be re-reached over. KC also has two people on shore. Uh, they've been trying to get a hold of the person, but they will not answer their phone. Roger, just be advised, we have searched several times with Agris. United Sector, Roger, stand by. 
should add the helo to the search. They've had uh, negative results. Tell them to do one more creeping search from the uh, beach access at Long Beach, back down to the North Jetty, and then call us once we get done that. 2-9 sector, we have that you do one more creeping uh, line search from Long Beach beach access down to the North Jetty. Got it. Looks like they're packing up over there. Oh uh, yeah, jet skis are out of the water, sir, from the fire department. Yeah, I sure hope they track that number down. It just turns out to be a hoax. It will find them big time. False alert. Probable That's false alert. Nice. I would be probable false alert. Somebody's wanting to see the fire engines and the, the helicopters and stuff like that. Uh, I guess they have an address, but I don't know if they're going to go and do a welfare check, which is something I'd hope they do. I'm going to call PAC 911 again and see. One more time. Yeah. Let's do that, and then let's start putting these in your bed. Sector from 2 Niner, wondering if you have any further tasking for us at this time. Over. 2 Niner Sector, be advised. We're on the line with command, waiting their uh, guidance on this. You know, things just aren't adding up on this one right now. We have another full hour search that we could give to them, but I'm concerned about uh, our asset utilization. So then with your concurrence, Commander, then we're gonna go ahead and brief district on that, that we our intentions are to bring the aircraft back. 29 sector be advised, you are clear to RTB once you have finished whatever search you are currently conducting. Roger, copy, we're actually just finished our search, and we are RTB at this time. For a be advised, we're RTB at this time. Roger, you guys are RTB. Not really sure why people make those calls, but uh, they do. When somebody's in distress, we feel privileged to be out there to help them. But when we get those false reporting sources, it's just a little bit uh, demoralizing. But uh, you know, that's what we're there to do. And uh, so we just look forward to the next opportunity. We're out here on the flanks of Mount Hood at the Clackamas River for a station morale event. We're gonna do some uh, whitewater rafting. We also have the, the just great opportunity to bring the four cadets that are visiting us this summer from the Coast Guard Academy along on this morale trip. Training at Cape Disappointment is definitely a whole new experience for us. Doing stuff like this with the station is another new thing to try. <laughs> When we can take the time to set aside a day like this, you know, it takes that next step in bringing them closer together, giving them a better understanding of the people they work with and what that person's all about. Hang on for here, life. Yeah! It was an amazing feeling to be able to go rafting, especially with the crew, since we didn't really know the crew that well, but we quickly learned that they were great people. <laughs> <laughs> it was our second day there, so we did not know hardly anybody. It kind of gives you your first sea story uh, to share with the crew, and so you already you already have that bond. You already have a couple jokes. It's just it gives you something to break the ice uh, right away. Ready, up for it, up for it, hard, hard. Next time they're out on that case in heavy weather, you know, they know a little more about that person. They know more what their personality is, what they're all about, and, and I think that's important. Overall, from the rafting trip, I can say that we really bonded. I was just really glad that the morale trip happened, especially so early in our time here. Go on a case for a guy that might be in the water over at Tillamook. He had called his girlfriend, said that he was going to jump off a cliff or swim into the ocean. If their mission is to kill themselves, it, it's hard to know what you're going to find. The potential is for a person to be either on the water or on the rocks, deceased or badly injured. Sector 13, be to go on a case for a guy that might be in the water over at Tillamook. 
We had weather coming in about 2,000 feet and clear as day underneath that, so the weather was pretty good, and Tillamook is about 15 minutes away from us. Report ready to take off. So there was a dude who was reported as a missing person by his girlfriend. He had called his girlfriend, said that he was going to jump off a cliff or swim into the ocean. Launching on possible suicides is always hard. You have hope that they survive, but if their mission is to kill themselves, it, it's hard to know what you're going to find. The cell phone company tracked his phone to the tip of Tillamook Head, and then they said it was like a cold shutdown, like someone either pulled the battery out or it was smashed or, you know, fell in the water or something. So the potential is for a person to be either on the water or on the rocks, deceased or badly injured. When we arrived on scene, we searched the shoreline, try and see if we could find him on a cliff or near the shore and possibly close to the shore. Let's get a little bit closer in here, if you don't mind. We have uh, just a chance to look out the door. We made several passes in the search area. You know, depending upon our orientation to the cliff, I was looking out the right side out the cabin door, and the swimmer, Chris Fisher, was looking out on the left side. So I think this is the highest part of the trail here, that there's a cloud sitting over the top of this. And it's right up in the trees. And he could have just got pitched and chucked his cell phone off. Yeah, a lot of possibilities. If we looked at this area down here, what do you think about going a little higher and looking up there a little bit further on the, on the hill? without flying up into those clouds. I'd be good with that. Sector Columbia River 6013. Be advised we are leading. Oh. Hey, I got uh, uh, bark, bark, bark. Got it. On the left hand side, on the way. Waving hands. Up there on the cliff. Blue shirt, black pants, waving at us. As I'm talking on the radio, I spot this little, faint little thing right on the side of the hill, just these two little hands waving, and that's really all I could see. We brought him up on our camera on the helicopter, and we marked that position and came back around. And he continued to wave at us, and he was about halfway up the mountain there, right on the edge. Probably 100, 150 feet from the uh, bottom. Stay this far away and just kind of ease forward. And uh, you got all right, this is as close as we can tell, but I don't want to blow him off. They're waving for us. Yeah, he looks like he's in pain. We didn't really know what he needed at that time. We just knew he was waving, and I didn't know how injured he was. As a crew, we talked about how we were going to get to this guy, how we were going to help him, how we were going to get him out of that situation. Let's talk about this. This person's waving for us. They're not moving. So uh, what do you all want to do? Just looking at that for the hoist. That looks pretty sketchy. Looks like a pretty tough spot to get to from above. Yeah, it really does. The cloud tops are sitting right over the top of Tillamook Head. So we couldn't get on top, and we couldn't necessarily get high enough to hoist so that we're not knocking debris down onto the survivor. What do you think about putting me down there on the beach and I hike up to him? Do you think you could hike up there? I think if I stayed along the left-hand side from where the way I'm looking straight at the hill, where that erosion came down, Here's my only concern. That looks like it's pretty slick, you know. Loose rock. Loose rock. If, if you slide down. I'm not going to do anything, like, precarious. But if I get up there and it's impossible, then we're going to go to the second thing, and that's going to be always. You know what I mean? Okay. It took a lot of crew coordination to figure out how we were going to get to him, and we determined that it was not the brightest idea to go right over him and do a vertical surface hoist. So we came to the best decision to let Chris Fisher go all the way down and then climb up to the survivor himself. And swimmer's going down. Forward right, 15. Good hole. The swimmer is on deck. Once Justin lowered me down to the beach, I went over to the edge of the, of the hill. It looked a lot more benign from the air. Once I got to that hill, I realized how steep it was and how challenging it was actually going to be. I kind of had a path planned out from the helicopter, and so I started up that hill. Some of the parts were impassable. They were just literally vertical walls. Former from the 1-3. 
Chicago. Hey, if you get in a little trouble with your footing, if you stay to the left, it looks like there's a lot of uh, shrubbery and stuff. You might be able to work your way up to them and then make a 90 degree turn. You know I love you, Captain, because you're always looking out. Thanks, buddy. No problem. It's a little unnerving being a flight mechanic, seeing your rescue swimmer walking up a cliff, wondering, you know, okay, well, what happens if he falls or he gets hurt? The survivor is about 200 feet above the, the water on a fairly steep cliff. And at this point, we don't know if he's fallen from the top or if he's climbed up from the bottom. Hey, if you get in a little trouble with your footing, if you stay to the left, it looks like there's a lot of uh, shrubbery and stuff. You might be able to work your way up to him and then make a 90 degree turn. Thanks, buddy. This was a person that was up kind of on a slope, and there was trees all around him to where we couldn't really pull into a hover and hoist me down to him. I actually had to climb to this guy. Is he walking in the falling rock? Uh, he kicked one, he's kicking a couple down. Okay. I think he's pretty smart about that kind of stuff. I don't think he'll put himself in a bad spot. Like he's Once I got up to my survivor, I went ahead and asked him how he was doing, what was going on, and I just quickly assessed him to see if he had any injuries or anything, and, and he didn't. It was just a little cold being out in the weather. One three, Swimmer. Swimmer, one three, go ahead. Got to the uh, survivor. He doesn't have any injuries. We're going to obviously assume a little bit of risk climbing down here. I have mountaineering boots. He's got Nikes, so it's going to take a little while. There was no way for me to hoist him out of that area, so we had to climb back down. That was kind of a heavy decision because I knew once he was with me, I got to get him out of there safely. Like, nothing can happen to this guy. Now I got to protect him no matter what, and it was going to be a difficult climb down. Vector 1-3, be advised, the swimmer is on scene with the survivor. They are going to try to hike down the hill. It's a little unnerving watching the swimmer on the cliff. Now he's got the survivor that he's responsible for, and it just adds another uh, another problem to the scenario. If the survivor were to fall, you know, is he going to take Chris down with him? Now we have two injured people. Whoa, hold on, buddy. Oh, man. Good catch. Good catch. Good catch. Do we have other pilots back at the unit in case something happens to Chris here that we can try to like give him a heads up. Nope, there's no other pilots in the unit right now. Once we got safely down to the beach, we walked down onto the rocks and called the helicopter in. Swimmer, one three, go ahead. What do you think about stop for just one more? Right here, we can do a sad poop. When we were leaving the beach, we did what we call a sad poo, which is a, a, a hoist that we use this strap. I put around the guy's back, and then I hook myself in, and it hoists us both at the same time. Every time they do a hoist, it's putting everybody in a vulnerable situation. So if I can call for a device that only takes one hoist to effectively pick up two people at once, I'll always call for that. Former and survivor are at cabin door. Once the survivor got inside the cabin, he gave me the thumbs up. Uh, he didn't appear to have any injuries or anything like that. He was happy to be off the cliff face, for sure. Good job, Chris. The discussions inside the helicopter to come up with the best plan to get this done were exceptional. This place definitely has a, a part of my heart, and I really do enjoy operating in the Pacific Northwest. The people up here are extremely friendly, extremely generous, and it's always been my pleasure to help them out as best I can. Crew partner, crew approach. Crew crew approach. While the survivor and I were coming down the hill, it kind of dawned on me that this was a pretty significant experience in this young man's life, and uh, I wanted to kind of give him a memento to remember what had just happened and something that he can look back upon and kind of think about things with a little more experience. When we landed back at the air station, 
So I handed him a rock from that hill just to remind him about today and you know what we just did and what we just went through together. It's the Coast Guard. <laughs> Today we're getting underway with the cadets from the Coast Guard Academy who we've had on board here all summer. This will be their uh, last time underway and we're gonna take them out and do some surf training before they head back to the Coast Guard Academy. Make sure you zipper this guy, because it's about to get wet up here. Oh. <laughs> oh, at the end of the year, it's a huge tradition to, to get rid of your fourth class shields. We decided it would be really exciting if we could throw them into the surf. We get to the top of this wave, and, and just as we're cresting, we're told to go, to let go, and we throw them and they just fall right through the surf, and then they're gone. For me, it was definitely symbolic. Woo! We're finally able to let go of fourth class a year, let go of our shields. You know, we could just turn to each other and say, man, are we, are we glad that we came here? Are we glad that, that we're doing these things and that we're getting these awesome opportunities? Station Cape Disappointment, the Columbia River Bar, the Columbia River itself, the North Pacific Ocean, all those things can humble anybody. Crews understand that every mission they go out on can be the most challenging. They can see weather conditions that uh, they'll never see again in their careers. And it doesn't matter how much risk you manage or how much you recognize the risk, it doesn't make the waves stop. It doesn't make the wind stop blowing. Once you're out there, there's nothing you can do to turn Mother Nature off. So many of the people that you interact with every day in the community go to sea to make their living. We're there to protect them they're not there alone. We're there to ensure their safety and to be stewards of the environment that they operate in. That's really what being at Station Cape Deployment is all about. I think it's a great community and it's a, a great place to be a Coast Guardsman.